My name is Robin Taylor, and this is my argumentative presentation on race, wealth, and baby bonds. Black Lives Matter. This movement, according to the Black Lives Matter website, was started in 2013 by Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tomote in response to the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murderer, George Zimmerman. The summer of 2020, the Black Lives Matter movement took stronghold and was brought near to us all. As a supporter of this movement, you may agree with the peaceful protesting, the marching, and the demonstrating, but not with the rioting and looting. At least that was my opinion. That is, until I watched a video of author Kimberly Jones titled, How Can We Win? on her opinion of the rioting and looting. The next slide is a portion of this video. It is imperative that you witness this account to understand the basis of my argument. And get it, that they are so hopeless that getting that necklace, getting that TV, getting that change, getting that bed, getting that phone, whatever it is that they're gonna get, is that in that moment when the riots happen and if they present an opportunity of looting, that's their only opportunity to get it. We need to be questioning that why. Why are people that poor? Why are people that broke? Why are people that that food insecure, that clothing insecure, that they feel like their only shot, that they are shooting their shot by walking through a broken glass window to get what they need. And then people want to talk about, well, there's plenty of people who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and got it on their own. Why can't they do that? Let me explain to you something about economics in America. And I'm so glad that as a child, I got an opportunity to spend time at PUSH where they taught me this, is that we must never forget that economics was the reason that black people were brought to this country. We came to do the agricultural work in the South and the textile work in the North. Do you understand that? That's what we came to do. We came to do the agricultural work in the South and the textile work in the North. Now, if I right now, if I right now decided that I wanted to play Monopoly with you and for 400 rounds of playing Monopoly, I didn't allow you to have any money. I didn't allow you to have anything on the board. I didn't allow for you to have anything. And then we played another 50 rounds of Monopoly and everything that you gained and you earned while you were playing that round of Monopoly was taken from you. That was Tulsa. That was Rosewood. There are pla those are places where we built black economic wealth, where we were self-sufficient, where we owned our stores, where we owned our property and they burned them to the ground. So that's 450 years. So for 400 rounds of Monopoly, you don't get to play at all. Not only do you not get to play, you have to play on the behalf of the person that you're playing against. You have to play and make money and earn wealth for them and then you have to turn it over to them. So then for 50 years, you finally get a little bit and you're allowed to play. And every time that they don't like the way that you're playing or that you're catching up or that you're doing something to be self-sufficient, they burn your game. They burn your cards. They burn your Monopoly money. And then finally at the release and the onset of that, they allow you to play and they say, okay, now you catch up. Now at this point, the only way you're going to catch up in the game is if the person shares the wealth, correct? But what if every time you share the wealth, then there's psychological warfare against you to say, oh, you're an equal opportunity higher. So if I played 400 rounds of Monopoly with you and I had to play and give you every dime that I made, and then for 50 years, every time that I played, I, if you didn't like what I did, you got to burn it like they did in Tulsa and like they did in Rosewood. How can you win? How can you win? You can't win. The game is fixed. So when they say, why do you burn down the community? Why do you burn down your own neighborhood? It's not ours. We don't own anything. We don't own anything. There is, Trevor Noah said it so beautifully last night. There's a social contract that we all have. That if you steal or if I steal, then the person who is the authority comes in and they fix the situation. But the person who fixes the situation is killing us. So the social contract is broken.
And if the social contract is broken, why the fuck do I give a shit about burning the fucking football hall of fame, about burning a fucking target? You broke the contract when you killed us in the streets and didn't give a fuck. You broke the contract when for 400 years we played your game and built your wealth. You broke the contract when we built our wealth again on our own by our bootstraps in Tulsa and you dropped bombs on us. When we built it in Rosewood and you came in and you slaughtered us. You broke the contract, so fuck your target. Fuck your Hall of Fame. As far as I'm concerned, they could burn this bitch to the ground. And it still wouldn't be enough. And they are lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. After watching this video, I understood that they riot and loot because they don't have anything left which sparked so many questions. What was Tulsa and Rosewood? Why haven't I heard of this before? Didn't freed slaves receive something from the government after slavery ended? How did we get here? How did we get here? Historically, African Americans' wealth has been stolen time and time again. In Kimberly Jones' analogy of playing Monopoly, it implied an ongoing racial wealth gap embedded throughout the history of America, which caused me to think thoughts of how can African Americans really become equal to a white person? How can African Americans build their wealth? My intent is to examine the racial wealth gap, including causes and solutions, using the data that has been analyzed by prominent economists, and to further create more awareness about the solutions that are being presented. Although some people believe that we have entered a post-racial stage in America, the racial wealth gap persists and solutions to it have been proposed because systematic racism and oppression of Black Americans continues to this day. Many have debated over the causes of the racial wealth gap for years. Logically, if you are looking for the cause of a problem, then you are going to examine your history. According to Melvin Oliver, president of Pfizer College and an expert on racial and urban inequality, states that understanding the profound intersections of race and wealth opens a window to our past, how advantaged and disadvantaged are passed along through family wealth and how racial stratification is constructed and maintained. What you're about to see here is a promissory note issued by the government for 40 acres to a freed slave and a map of the land that was allocated for the freed slaves. In a blog by Hannah Packman, communications director for the National Farmers Union states that Union General William T. Sherman created a plan with a group of black ministers in Savannah, Georgia, of which 400,000 acres of property that was confiscated from Confederate landowners would be redistributed in 40 acre lot increments. By June, the land had been allocated to 40,000 of the 4 million freed slaves. Mules were not included in the original order, but the union did give away some as a part of an effort. That order was short-lived because President Andrew Johnson overturned the order before the end of the year and returned the land to the previous slave owners and traders. Packman states that the long-term financial implications of this reversal is staggering. In an article in Yes Magazine by journalist Jeff Newman analyzes the financial ramifications of the 40 acre and a mule promise reversal, finding that in today's dollar would amount to approximately $6.4 trillion. According to History.com, the Tulsa Race Massacre occurred on May 31st, 
until June 1st, 1921, lasting 18 hours. During that time, Tulsa's Greenwood District, commonly referred to as the Black Wall Street, was demolished. This included 35 square blocks of the entire business district and 12,000 homes. 4,000 black residents were detained for days under martial law and according to oral history of the survivors, scores of victims were buried in unmarked graves. It is estimated that between 100 to 300 people were killed, mostly black, and some 8,000 people were left homeless. Though 1.8 million claims were filed by black residents, all of them were denied. All of this occurred because a 19-year-old Dick Rowland, who was black, accidentally bumped into or possibly stepped on 17-year-old Sarah Page's foot, who was white, causing her to scream. This event was deliberately covered up due to news blackouts. Similarly, in Rosewood, Florida, on January 1st to January 7th, 1923, a white woman named Fanny Taylor accused an unknown black man of assaulting her, which incited a white mob that subsequently burned the city to the ground. The news of this faded away, that is, until 1982 when journalist Gary Moore resurrected the history. Survivors came forward and demanded restitution, which led to a bill awarding them $2 million and creating an educational fund for survivors. Derek Hamilton, professor of economics and urban policy at the New School, argues that history shows Black Americans have been systematically deprived and destroyed by white rioters and terrorists as well as with the restrictions of conveyance, redlining, and general housing and lending discrimination, which are all factors that have kept Black Americans from earning wealth. Oliver stated, historic wealth-assuming government policies, such as the Homestead Act, Federal Housing Act, and the GI Bill facilitated property ownership, home ownership, business development, and education largely for whites while systematically excluding similar opportunities for African Americans and other minority groups. The racial wealth gap is a result of both historical legacy and enduring contemporary racial discrimination. Furthermore, in an article by Terry Gross, journalist for the National Public Radio, stated that in the underwriting manual of the Federal Housing Administration, which said that incompatible racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same community meaning that loans to African Americans could not be insured. Which brings me back to the Kimberly Jones video. They were enslaved, then freed, but did not receive any restitution. And then anytime they obtained wealth, it was stolen from them by an angry white mob that would riot and loot and murder them. Then you have the governments that excluded them from public policies, from obtaining wealth, education, and home ownership. How can they even catch up? How can they get ahead? Systemically, Black Americans have been targeted and excluded from earning wealth, indicating that the accumulation of wealth does in part rely on intergenerational bequests and transfers of wealth. To further understand the causes of the racial wealth gap on Black America and the impact that the racial wealth gap has had, it is important to review and analyze the data and studies that have been presented. What is the racial wealth gap? It refers to the difference in assets accounted for by different racial groups. In the next few slides, I will be discussing what components play into the racial wealth gap. This chart is the median and the mean net worth of racial groups in the United States from 2019, retrieved from the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. 10%. Let me let that number sink in. 
10%. Black Americans have 10% of the wealth that white Americans have. You can clearly see this in both charts. This chart, also retrieved from the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, indicates that wealth rises with age for all families, but substantial wealth gaps between white and black families persist throughout a life cycle. Income inequality. Hero Ashman, PhD student in psychology at Berkeley at University of California, uses a quantitative model to analyze the data to explain to what extent income differences have on the racial wealth gap in the United States. Her study indicates that the racial wealth gap is a direct result of racial differences in labor income in the presence of bequest motives, intergenerational transfers of wealth, and social insurances. Adham Saeed, researcher and PhD student at Haothong University of Science and Technology, explains that the best way to model how economic growth relates to income inequality, he contends that the income inequality and in economic growth is not best represented as an inverted U, as it has been the pre previous prevailing economic theory called the Kuntz curve, but rather an N shape. This is justified by an empirical study of panel data in relation to the connection of income inequality and economic growth. Also, indicating with the continuing growth of the racial wealth gap, the GDP per capita will decrease, hurting us all. The data used to create this chart is from the Census Bureau. This is the 2019 racial income comparison. The data shows that the median income for a white family is approximately $72,200 annually, whereas the median income for a black household is approximately $45,400 annually, a difference of $26,800 annually. Next, I'm going to discuss how racial bequests have had an impact on the racial wealth gap. Does the lack of racial bequests have an impact on the racial wealth gap? According to Oliver, he argues that the current vast racial wealth gap is historically due to lack of ethical bequests and racial systemic discrimination through public policies, indicating that because Black Americans have not been able to freely accumulate wealth, that has led to the racial wealth gap, thus showing that the racial wealth gap not only started with the end of slavery, but continues to rapidly grow to present date. This chart from the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System indicates that white families are substantially more likely to receive inheritance, gifts, or other family support than black families, proving that there is a lack of intergenerational transfer of wealth. Are there any solutions to the racial wealth gap dilemma? In the next few slides, I will be discussing the solutions that economists have presented. Several economists have presented solutions to help close the racial wealth gap. Of these solutions, baby bonds would be the most effective, as well as not racially driven. You may be asking yourself, what is a baby bond? A baby bond would be a savings bond issued to all children born after December 31st, 2005, who are not 18 years of age. They will have access to the bond for eligible expenses once they reach 18 years of age. On February 4th, 2021, Senator Cory Booker and Representative Ayanna Presley introduced S-222 and H-R-835 bills to Congress 
This bill, called the American Opportunity Accounts Act, if passed, would create baby bonds. Next is a portion of an Instagram Live between Senator Cory Booker and Representative Ayanna Presley from when they introduced the bill to Congress. And today we are talking about a game changer um, that is for our children, right? It's, it's this idea that everybody in America should have an equal financial opportunity. And in, a, in, a, in this society in which we live, which is a capitalist society in perversion, we, we are in a perverted capitalist society, we take in our tax code hundreds of billions of dollars, about six to seven hundred billion dollars, and give people with wealth more tax breaks to create more wealth. And for the people who are struggling working every day, we don't do anything for them. And so you and I have a bill that is catching momentum over here in the Senate called baby bonds. And that's what we wanted to talk about today. And baby bonds, I'll describe it quickly and then, and then let you, uh, Congresswoman. Okay, you do that and I'm gonna try to get a comfortable angle here. Okay. <laughs> okay. You are, you are beautiful up close. Uh, uh, your your, your just... beauty and your strength come through. Not working uh, with you today. All right, well, I'm gonna describe it while you try to find a, an angle and a position. But for everybody who don't know, is, is paychecks help you get by. In America, wealth helps you get ahead. And we believe in the richest nation on the planet Earth. Every child born in America should have a, a, a interest-bearing account with $1,000, regardless of income, regardless of race. And every year of that child's life, uh, through our tax code, we, like the Earned Income Tax Credit, we would put upwards of $2,000 into that account, depending on the wealth of your parents. And so the wealthiest kids in America, God bless them, uh, they would have... Uh, very little uh, uh, put into the account. But, but, but working class folks, kids in poverty, would have upwards of the maximum put into that account. And because it's interest bearing and because of the power of compound interest, by the time a child is 18, uh, they could have upwards of $50,000 in an interest bearing account. And, and that money can be used for wealth building things, going to college, uh, starting a business, buying a home. It is an er effort to create generations of wealth. And the powerful thing about this is a lot of the people who have studied our bill is they see that it, it would have a, an incredible effect. It would, it would level the economic playing field. It would deeply address the racial wealth gap in America. Because in, a, in the United States of America right now, the wealth gap is growing between blacks and whites. This That's would true. create a fair playing field um, in, a, in a tremendous way. And so... Uh, Congresswoman Presley on the House side and me on the Senate side are reintroducing this bill. And the exciting thing for me is it was lonely when we introduced it the first time, <laughs> just me. Now right. we've got 15 senators on it, including Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. So we're gaining traction and momentum. And we hope that with the Biden administration, if they really want to build back better, why not do something that get rid of the wealth disparities along racial lines? That's right. Lines. So that's the bill yeah. uh, and and when i have a partner like you i get excited about what we can get done well thank you thank you senator and um you know you you started talking about dr king and um i take a special uh a stakehold uh representing boston which is where he and coretta uh first met and you can't talk about uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and not talk about Coretta Scott King. Um, she was more than his wife. Uh, she was more than a widow that picked up the mantle. Um, she was in fact already um, a visionary and a radical dreamer and an activist in her own right. And it is because of their union that Dr. King um, took the position that he did uh, being against the Vietnam War. Um, affirmed the need for a federal jobs guarantee. Uh, so uh, they were a, a force. And they gave us, in those early chapters of the Civil Rights Movement, which we are still in, it never ended, the blueprint, yes. which is to organize, which is to mobilize, and then to legislate our values. Poverty is not naturally occurring. It is a policy choice. And the disproportionate hurt and harm that has been foisted onto Black Americans 
legalized, legislated, and on to other marginalized groups is why we see the inequities, the disparities, the racial injustices, the racial wealth gap that we do. In the city of Boston, which is, I represent in the Massachusetts 7th, the wealth for a black family is $8. And that of a white family is $247,000. It is and, stunning. It, stunning. Stunning. Say that again so people understand. For, for, for the average wealth of a black family is what? $8. And the average wealth of a white family in the Boston area is what? $247,000. Now, what's the, what's the game changer there? Other than policy violence, discriminatory, uh, draconian, precise policies like redlining, which obstructed our ability to build generational wealth. Um, you know, the, the, the change, the issue there, the difference in that wealth is home ownership, right? Uh, equity. And we know black home ownership is the lowest today than it's been since fair housing laws were introduced. And so we have to be as precise and prescriptive in legislating equity as we have been disproportionately harmed by policy violence. Dr. King, weeks before his murder, said that getting the right to vote didn't cost the nation anything. Integrating a lunch counter didn't cost the nation anything, and I'm paraphrasing. But he, he argued that the challenges that we confront as a nation now, and again, this is weeks before uh, his murder, were going to cost the nation something. It was going to demand a complete restructuring of American society's architecture. And so when President Biden and Vice President Harris say that they want to build back better, that's music to my ears. Because what we know, Senator, is that we cannot level set to a pre-COVID unjust, inadequate, and insufficient normal. If we are truly in the midst of a reckoning, which is something of epic proportions, quite literally biblical, that reckoning, as Reverend Barber reminds us, demands of us a reconstruction, a third reconstruction. And our bill, the American Opportunities Act, also known as baby bonds, is critical to that reconstruction, is critical to a just and equitable economic recovery from this pandemic, which has laid bare the inequities and disparities and racial injustices and only compounded them and so this is the sort of um, prescriptive, targeted, race conscious policies that we need to be advancing at this period of reconstruction. And the fact that that baby bond, that that seed account is targeted to those families in the lowest income and that that accrues over time and based upon your income, additional deposits are made every year and at 18 years that those funds can be used to uh, pursue higher education, to purchase a home. And um, Senator, if you'll talk a little bit about the projections that we've, um, that economists have given us in terms of how much money that could be, yeah. what the range could be. Can I just say something? Because I, when I talk to you, you drop these wisdom bombs <laughs> and uh, you said something to me that I feel like I want to tweet out which is that poverty is a policy choice. That was so powerful. It's not naturally occurring that we in America have made policy decisions that have That's created right. amongst the 35 richest nations in the, in the world. We are in the bottom five for, in terms of our poverty rates. And, it, and, and other countries have made different policy choices and they, their child poverty rates are dramatically lower. And our, our poverty policy choices have been everything. You said redlining disinvestment by government agencies like the FHA and others with their discriminatory policy, We're literally running highways through black communities from New Haven to Newark. Um, um, these, all these policy choices have amounted to a nation, the richest in the world with some of the highest poverty rates of, every, of all the industrial nations. And what we are saying, and I love the way you were terming it about a new reconstruction, we are saying we need to make different policy choices 
that address the past, doesn't, doesn't ignore it, that speaks truth to the past and plots a pathway uh, towards prosperity for all. That's and, so, right. and so baby bonds is a very practical thing that will address poverty for everybody, whether it's Appalachian poverty or Detroit poverty, or, 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 it, it, or, or no matter who you are as a child, but it will also wipe out the racial disparities for, for by the time a child is, is a teenager in terms of the wealth that they have. And it's because of the way we have structured the bill. Everybody born gets a thousand dollar account. And by the way, when we start this, we would start if you're 15, you would get those three years. So you get a thousand dollars into an account and then based upon your family income, you could get up to $2,000 for the, for the kids. Unfortunately, the one out of every six kids or so, now one out of every five after this pandemic, it's poor. About 20% of our children would get the full amount. Now, because there are disproportionately Native American children are poorer than disproportionately white, the average, the average Native American child would get more towards the $30,000 by the That's time right. they're 18. Uh, the average uh, white child uh, would probably get more around 18, 19. But if you are a poor child of any background, you're going to get the full amount in. And so that, were, that is close to $50,000 to address the student debt crisis because kids would have that, that nest egg. Um, it would address the, the home ownership crisis. Our bill, surprisingly, is endorsed by home builders because they know that, um, that, that the equity that can be built in, house, in housing. This is what happened to African-Americans who were generally denied this by That's redlining right. and other practices, but building wealth in your home, people, you, could, you can borrow against that for college, you can do a second mortgage. This has helped so many Americans. So creating this wealth, um, uh, upwards of $50,000 for our lowest income children, The Senate currently has 15 co-sponsors to the American Opportunity Accounts Act. The House of Representatives currently has 22 co-sponsors for the American Opportunities Accounts Act. It is clear to me that the racial wealth gap is a major problem in this country and the solution needs to be implemented. The racial wealth gap has been caused by centuries of mistreatment of African Americans. This mistreatment has made it impossible for African Americans to succeed in the same manner as those not burdened by the same mistreatment. While some may argue that any solution may be too expensive or that it is not the government's place to redistribute wealth, the solution of a baby bond needs to be implemented to take care of this problem.